So here's a fun question. Are we going to be able to find terrestrial planets no matter where we go in the galaxy? Do these planets exist everywhere? Now this is a question we don't generally ask ourselves, but it's an assumption that a lot of scientists make today. Assumption that everything in the universe is very likely similar to what we have right here on planet Earth and in the solar system. But for all we know, this assumption is incorrect. This is a Gaia-centric approach, an approach suggesting that whatever is happening on planet Earth is going to be happening everywhere. And so in today's video we're going to be investigating one of the recent studies from the Japanese uh, university that tries to find out one thing. Do similar planets to, for example, Jupiter, Neptune, Saturn, and so on, exist everywhere else in the galaxy? Or are planets and other things in the star system completely different depending on the region where you locate it? Hello, wonderful person, this is Anton, and let's actually talk about this, because this is a pretty important investigation. And it's important because of the typical human bias. We have a tendency to think of things in very anthropocentric or human-centered and also Earth-centered terms. We believe that whatever is happening around us is probably happening everywhere else in the galaxy and, of course, everywhere else in the universe. And this is one of the major reasons why early astronomers, such as Shepard Rayleigh, truly believed that Mars is very similar to planet Earth and seems to contain these large areas that he referred to as canali, which some people later assumed were channels and that Mars was probably full of Martians traveling across channels on this beautiful planet. Today we of course know that none of this is true. Something similar was assumed of Venus. Venus was actually thought of being a sister planet of planet Earth. But in the late 20th century, the scientists were surprised to find out that Venus was actually entirely different. Which of course led to various ideas in regards to the development of planets in the solar system depending on the location away from the Sun. So, for example, you're going to have somewhat terrestrial, possibly even habitable planets in the region known as the habitable zone away from the star, but you're also going to have much cooler planets on the outskirts. Or, I guess, really hot planets close to the Sun. And so naturally, one could assume that something similar would happen with the galaxy. Are there actual regions in the galaxy where you would expect certain types of stars and certain types of planets? Well, we know that with stars, this seems to be the case. For example, you're more likely to find ancient stars very low in metals and thus probably containing very different types of planets, a lot of gas giants, on the outskirts of a typical galaxy. The older the star, the farther away from the galaxy it's most likely to be. On the other hand, a lot of high metallicity stars are going to be slightly closer to the center of the galaxy. And so in those regions we might technically expect more terrestrial planets. I mean, that's an assumption, but nobody really has a way of testing any of this just yet. And so how do you possibly test any of this and how do you find out if planets like for example Jupiter can actually exist in other regions of the galaxy? Or do galaxies like star systems have specific regions where you have some sort of a habitable galactic zone, some sort of a ice line after which you expect certain types of planets, or the inner region where there might be only certain types of planets as well? Okay, so honestly at the moment there's really no way for us to discover any of this because the current telescopes are not really able to see that far. We're not able to find planets far, far away. So for example, if we were to look at most of the exoplanets we know of today, the vast majority were discovered in that red cone you see right there. This is essentially the Kepler telescope's observational area. And as you can see, pretty much most of them are in a somewhat similar region of space in regards to all of the other stars in a galaxy. And in this region, we know that the vast majority of stars seems to be either so-called mini-Neptunes, super-Earths, or the recently identified Hycean planets that I've discussed in one of the previous videos. But also quite a lot of rocky planets and a lot of planets similar to planet Earth. But how do we study these other stars and other planets? Well, you can see that a lot of these planets identified in this region were detected using the method known as the gravitational microlensing. In most cases, all of them were seen in this way. They passed in front of a bright star and they bent the light just a little bit. Specifically, they created this tiny, tiny amount of bending that was then interpreted as an exoplanet in front of or next to a parent star. So this is really the only way for us to currently identify distant planets far, far away and close to the galactic center. Unfortunately, no other telescope at the moment is able to see exoplanets in any other way this far away from planet Earth. 
And here we're talking about distances of like thousands and thousands of light years away from us. And so that's kind of what the scientists in this paper decided to do. They decided to combine all of the observations, specifically gravitational lensing observations, combining them with a model known as the galactic model to figure out the statistical distribution of these planets and mathematically determine if we're going to be able to find similar planets to what we have in the solar system in other regions of the galaxy, specifically in the regions close to the center of the Milky Way. And this is the region that a lot of scientists are kind of interested in studying more about, mostly because, first of all, we know almost nothing about it, and second of all, because some of the recent studies have already established that it's very likely that there might be some signs of extraterrestrial civilizations in this particular region. Once again, a video about this is somewhere right there. And so what did the scientists in this paper discover? Now, first of all, it's important to understand that this is only in regards to larger objects objects that are more massive, so things like Jupiter, things like Saturn, and not really terrestrial planets. There's still no way for us to kind of see any of this. Future telescopes can help us with this, but at the moment, for gravitational lensing to work, we need to have extremely accurate observations that are currently not possible. Nevertheless, in the study, the scientists uh, took the 28 known events of microlensing effects, the microlensing that was definitely caused by various planets, closer to the central region of the galaxy and combine this with their galactic model to work out the approximate number of planets depending on the region away from the center of the galaxy. And since in this particular case it was impossible for them to know the distance to these microlensing effects, they had to find a way around this in order to establish the actual distances. And so here to try to work out the distance to certain stars with certain planets, they instead relied on the total time of the lensing effect combined with the relative motion, which allowed the scientists in this case to roughly work out where each of these planets was located compared to our location here on planet Earth. And their discovery suggests that there is really no correlation between the location in the galaxy and the number of planets. Or in other words, that planets similar to Jupiter, Saturn and a lot of other massive gas giants should technically be located in equal numbers everywhere in the galaxy with this image right here roughly illustrating their discovery and their analysis. So this is planet Earth, and each of these blue dots you see are all sorts of different gas giants and all sorts of different Neptune-like worlds that have been discovered in the last few years through various gravitational lensing effects. And as you can kind of see in the picture again, the distribution seems to be more or less the same. Which of course also suggests that we should be able to find a lot of these planets in the central bulge as well which to some extent can also be seen as a surprising discovery. Today we believe that the galactic bulge does actually have slightly different environmental conditions, so some planets here might be very different. And in this case maybe they are different, but in terms of masses, they seem to be similar to typical planets in the solar system. And so just like back in the days we believed Venus to be a sister planet with relatively similar conditions, or in this case Mars as well, it's somewhat possible that a lot of these planets, despite having similar mass, could be absolutely different from what we actually have here in the solar system, simply based on the emissions from the center of the galaxy, something we refer to as the galactic winds. Now we know that the Milky Way galaxy was active at least twice in the last few million years, and we know this based on the discovery of what's known as Fermi bubbles the emissions that were very likely caused by some sort of a massive eruption from the center. And so it would be natural to assume that these emissions would somehow change and transform some of the planets. We obviously have no idea what any of this means just yet, but it's obviously too early to assume that the planets we've discovered are in any way similar in terms of properties to the ones we have in the solar system. They're similar in mass, and they might be also relatively similar in temperature, but they might have very, very different surfaces and they might also have very different conditions. But nevertheless, the discovery from this particular paper at the moment suggests that the total distribution of planets is more or less equal across the entire galaxy. As a matter of fact, at least one of these unusual observations was from a system of two stars. It was actually a circumbinary planet, a planet orbiting two stars, something that's sometimes referred to as the Tatooine planet from Star Wars. At the same time, the scientists in this paper mentioned that based on the metallicity and the density of stars, and also based on the amount of star interaction with their neighbors, we expect certain planetary systems to have more or less planets. And so by being located much closer to the center of the galaxy, 
the actual environment in this region could hypothetically and dramatically change the total number of the planets, but at the moment this is just a speculation and does not have any physical proof. The only definitive proof is that a lot of cold planets, the planets that normally form in star systems beyond what's known as the snow line, seem to be more or less common no matter where in the galaxy they're located. And so in that sense it is a pretty interesting and pretty exciting study. But a lot more observations are needed and a lot more accurate observations in order to establish more about these planets and in order to establish a much more accurate density of planetary objects in the entire galaxy. At the moment we'll probably just need to have a better telescope. For example, Nancy Grace Roman Telescope is going to be able to see a lot more of these gravitational lensing effects. And once we're able to see more of these gravitational lensing effects, it will become much easier to create a kind of a planetary map across the entire galaxy. And since these gravitational lenses only happen like once per million years, we only get to see each of these planets once. And so every new detection suggests that there's more planets in a certain region. But I guess until we learn more, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and check out all the relevant links in the description below. Maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.